according to our chromosomes, scientifically, women can give birth and men cannot. That's not a prejudiced statement. That That's just yeah. scientifically what it is. First of all, if I'm going to be with you, your problems become my problems and my problems become your problems. That's the reality of life, right? Big so facts. I would like to date someone that takes good care of their health and vice versa. The minimum problems. Men, and I mean this with love, are relatively simple beings. We, I say this all the time. You are, you're yes. relatively simple beings. It's that women don't understand because women, Women feel so much all the time. If you keep saying yes to something, the universe will keep delivering more of it. It's that Big simple. Yeah. So if you don't like it, don't keep going back for more. Yo guys, welcome back to another episode on my channel. I'm sitting in this spot, which means, which means I've got a great conversation lined up for you today. You know, on this channel, we love talking about all things dating and relationships and seeing what we can do to attract the kind of person we want. So without further ado, Please welcome Yasmin to the show. Welcome thank Yasmin. You. How are you today? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. She was uh, giving us some insights about how the world works, but that's not what we're going to chat about today. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to keep it safe. Um, well, I always love to jump straight in. So tell us your age or age range, asking a lady her age, and something a guy should know about you if he's going to take you on a date. Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, my age, I'm 34. Mm -hmm. And what should a guy know if he's going to take me on a date? Mm, I have, about you. say that again? Yeah, what should he know about you? He should know that I've got very, I'm quite fussy with food and I have very high standards with restaurants. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That sounds high maintenance. That's just joking. Uh, a Is little, it? A little. Oh, okay. No, okay. not no, not really. But just my hey, friend, own my, it, girl. No, own one it. of my friends, she always says to me, she's like, babe, have you do you, do you realize that you're fussy? And I'm like, well, a few people have said it to me now, so I'll I I must be if other people are giving me this feedback. So Okay. So would you not meet up for a guy with a guy for coffee? Yeah, I would, yeah, hundred percent. Oh, but okay. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> We could get a tea or yeah, a tea would be just fine. a cup of milk. Give that <laughs> that's mm. your thing. Um so when you say you're fussy about restaurants is it there has to be like a certain like threshold in terms of how nice it is or like no. what? what do you mean no 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 more just like the cleanliness and the quality of the food so for example i would never eat anything that comes out of a microwave so i can't yeah. go to a restaurant like tgi fridays because uh, okay. you see what i mean okay so it's just more, it's just the quality of the food it, it doesn't have to be particularly anything just the really good quality food and really clean yeah I do want to start with something. What did guys get wrong about you? Um, what do they get wrong about me? Yeah. Is there like a presumption they make about you? Is there something that misunderstand about you? I think because the nature of my job okay. is quite emotionally consuming and very deep. It means that I'm talking about a lot of very deep, intimate things with people a lot of the time. Can you tell us what your job is? Yeah, so I mean, I call myself an alchemist because I don't really like that saturated terminology of like coach and mentor. Mm -hmm. I have applied myself to my life's traumas and using them as, as opportunities to become a better person, mm. to apply myself to learning psychology, astrology, quantum physics and everything in between. And so I teach people how to use their pain and their struggles to their advantage. Mm. And so that will include a lot of things like relationship coaching, a lot of life mentoring, sometimes facilitating plant medicine experiences. So I'll just use any any tool that I have developed and and fine tuned in my life. If you've got any type of problem or anything that you're struggling with in your life, I will teach you any tool that I have in my kit and I have done pretty much everything that you can do in in terms of modalities of healing. Okay. So there's probably one or two floating around that maybe I haven't done that much of. And so it doesn't matter if you're going through a breakup, whether you were cheated on, whether you can't stop cheating, whether you're doing drugs with prostitutes on a Wednesday night when your wife's pregnant, it doesn't matter what your situation is. That sounds like a very specific scenario. That oh, no, no. I'm, d I'm just saying <laughs> know, that I'm some, just some of the stuff that I see is like, you know, quite out there by comparison to what some people think is quite, you know, serious. Mm. Um, and so my point being that like, I'm not judging the experience. I'm here to teach you how to use that experience to your advantage. Yes. Um, is, is what I do really. And so it, whatever the client needs is I will facilitate it. Interesting. So in your experience from your male and female clients, I assume you have both mm -hmm. in the dating relationship realm, is there, has there been something you've seen more consistent with men and something you've seen more consistent with women? Mm, yeah. So 
maybe not necessarily like the actual thing. I think, you know, like the obvious things that people think about things like cheating. And I think mm. cheating happens with both men and women. Yep. And I think that women are more likely to leave the relationship now more than ever for so many different reasons. And I think you can, you can look at many aspects when you're considering that debate. But I would say that one of the main things that I see come up as, as a root of a problem is that a lot of men don't have many um, outputs for their emotions. You know, there's, it's not, free. you know, women, girls, like if you look at a playground of children, girls will be sitting around talking about their feelings all day, every day. You know, did that, that upset me or oh, don't pull my hair. You know, we're always expressing how we feel. And it's not that I don't believe that men feel less than women. That's not true. I think that we have been conditioned for centuries that the only real emotion that's acceptable for men to express in public is anger. You know, it's like if a man shows aggression, then we can see, we can see that he's emotional, right? And that's the only thing that's acceptable. But if he cries, we society sees that as weakness. I mean, me personally, I see that as great vulnerability and an act of strength. But, you know, I think society lacks a huge amount of education overall surrounding emotions, what they mean, how they're portrayed. Mm -hmm. You know, anger is a primary and a secondary emotion. And what that means is that the the root of anger is sadness. It's built it's up. Yeah, yes. it's pain, right? Exactly, yes. And so, you know, I think that men carry more pain than women in some ways because they have less outlets to express it. And obviously, you know, energy needs to move. It needs to get out of the body. Um, and that's not me saying that men suffer more than women. I, I think that every human being suffering and experience is valid. I'm not, I, I really don't like that gender battle between, you know, like men are like this and women are like this. Yes, we have some physiological differences. Absolutely. Mm. There are things that are not debatable that where we are different, women can give birth, men can't, right? Like these are yes. obvious things. However- Even saying that now, some people would contest you, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> scientifically, with no prejudice, scientifically, according yes. to the chromosomes and the way our bodies operate thus far, and except for the very small percentage, less than 1% of human beings that are hermaphrodites, which is a different- Kettle of fish. fish yeah. According to our chromosomes, scientifically, women can give birth and men cannot. That's not a prejudice statement. That that's yeah. just scientifically what it is. Exactly. Apart from the small percentage that's an anomaly. Yeah. So physiologically, yes, we we are different and we can say certain things. But I think that one of the things that leads into or feeds into relationship dynamics being difficult sometimes is because we have this narrative in society that men are this and women are that. And, you know, women are only gold diggers or men only want one thing. And it's like, no, we're wired differently mm -hmm. as a result of being animals. So if you go back into to a certain day and age, like in caveman times, you know, women seek security. Very How has that evolved into today's society? We exactly. seek security in the same ways and in different ways. 100%. And same like with men, right? Like men want freedom. Like men are wired for freedom. Yes. And a woman's need for security threatens the man's need for freedom. And the man's need for freedom threatens the woman's need for security. Very true. However, that very polarity is what makes us attracted to one another. Yes. Even in same sex relationships as well, you know, the polarity of the masculine and the feminine energy. 100%. It doesn't matter if you've got guy, 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 girl, or girl, girl. It makes no difference. There's still, there's still a more masculine role that's being played in each scenario. Yes. There's and, a more masculine core and a more yeah. feminine core. 100%. So I think that that polarity is really important and I think it's really important to appreciate our differences mm -hmm. and rather than it being like, oh, it's his fault or it's her fault in a relationship, it's more like, okay, this is, the problem is, is that you're complaining about this because you're seeking more connection and you're complaining about this because you're not feeling heard, which is also seeking deeper connection. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how can I make you feel heard? Tell me what I can do or how I can approach you. How, how can I behave in a conversation? that's going to make you feel more heard, mm. but not just certain things to do, like actually do like, do you need me to ask you more questions? Well, obviously, because you're not hearing him or her, you're not demonstrating that you hear. So you need to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. I think it's that we're lacking education on communication amongst many other things. Yes. I, I completely agree. I think uh, you're a hundred percent right in there's this constant um, ebb and flow of the dynamic, especially between the masculine and the feminine with men and women, especially in regards to the freedom and the security, right? Um, 
And I think one thing that I guess what I want to ask you, maybe you work with your clients or maybe in your own experience, right? If you feel, and I don't know, I'm just making assumptions, you tell me, if you feel you sit more in your feminine with in your relationships, your dating, et cetera, how have you balanced for yourself balancing the need for security and also the need for his freedom in that sense? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know this from your line of work as well, right? A lot of women are very needy in a lot of ways. And I, and I, and listen, I'm not shaming that, right? Because we all have needs and it's normal and it's human to have needs, yep. right? How we articulate what we need is really where it starts to get interesting and important. Yes. So for me personally, I'm a pretty easygoing woman for, for the, for most, for most of the time. So uh, there are certain things that like, just don't, don't, don't work for me. And I've got no problem setting my boundaries mm. and I wouldn't be entertaining a man that wouldn't be in the same way of thinking anyway, yes. given my line of work, I'm usually pretty good at identifying quite early on. Um, if we're somewhat compatible with the way that we view things right mm -hmm. now, I don't think you need to like all of the same things for a relationship to work, but I think you need to have an overall similar view on life. Mm. I think that's very important for compatibility. So yes. you can notice that quite early on with somebody. For me personally, I want my man to have freedom. I want my man to have a full whole life outside of our relationship. Because what if something goes wrong in my life and I can't support you the way that I once was? What if I need to go and support my family or my friends or my career takes a turn for a couple of months or something? Yeah. You need to have your own life. You're not dependent on me for your happiness and vice versa. Yes. I like to be very together with my partner as long as it's not overwhelming for them. You know, I mm. like it when we can run errands together. I like it when we can do impromptu dinners together, but I also like it when we plan things. So the fact that I'm quite versatile probably helps. Mm. Second of all, the fact that I have the education that I have. So I'm very relaxed and trusting of the universe that if for some reason I'm with somebody that does something that's outside of my boundaries, I trust that the universe is going to show me that and I will be given the information required for me to make an educated and informed decision about whether or not this relationship, this person is alignment with where I'm headed. Yes. Outside of that, I'm not too worried about snooping through someone's phone or not. If I feel like I need to go through your phone, we're already in trouble. Yeah, already in trouble. Yeah? Yes. Now, years ago, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> However, now it's like, it's, I, I think that you know in your body, but I think the problem is, is that many people are disconnected from their body. Or you, some people will have trauma in which is informing the message that their body is telling them. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly that, right? So yes. it's like that. So, okay, look, the phone thing, let's talk about that, right? Yeah. Because that's quite a big one in terms of freedom, right? I think we're all entitled to privacy. I'm mm -hmm. entitled to have conversations on my phone with my girlfriends. For me personally, my clients text my phone. So my partner can't really be going through my phone because I've got intimate details. Would I mind my partner having access to my phone? Absolutely not. Because if I've got nothing to hide, if you've left your phone on charge in the bedroom and we're in the living room and you need to Google something on the phone quickly you should be able to pick up my phone and be able to do that. They, sure. I should, it shouldn't be like, because <gasps> my partner's got my phone in his hand, you know, yeah. um, unless it's because you're organizing a surprise birthday other than that, or, you know, yes. other than obvious things that are like, you know, kosher, it, yes. it shouldn't be an issue for you. So I believe in an open phone policy personally. This, this is what I would advise if I'm asked for advice, okay. but each to their own, like you have to do what's comfortable for you. So for me personally, I don't have anything to hide. I'm super loyal and I don't find it difficult to be loyal. So I don't really have any problems with that. However, that doesn't mean that if you've irritated me that morning, I might not have like vented to my best friend about you and said how much you're getting on my nerves. Um, yeah, you still don't want your partner to see stuff like that, right? Exactly. My, and I, my belief is that if you go looking for something, you're always going to find something to back that up. Because like you said about the trauma, our blueprints are wired for the narrative to always be the same. Yes. And the world reflects back what we believe. See, what we believe. At 100%. Exactly. 100%. Yes. So if you believe that he's attracted to other women, even if he's not messaged another girl, you'll still find boy chat where he's talking about how another girl's so hot because you will always find something that you don't want to see. So just don't look. Yeah. Now, if you truly believe that your partner's cheating on you and you're looking for evidence, that's a slightly different conversation. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, if, you've, you're in, if you're in a healthy relationship or, you know, pretty regular relationship and you're working on the health side, then you need to give your partner freedom. They need to have 
relationships in their life that are fulfilling to them outside of their relationship with you, whether that be with their friends, their family, their colleagues, yes. their relationship with money, their relationship with their body. You know, if I think about the hours in a day upon which I do things for myself, it's probably like half my day, like going to the gym, walk the dog, mm. have a shower, meditate, you know, that's yeah. like four hours. Yeah. That's, that's demonstrating a relationship with responsibility, taking care of another being like the dog, you know, relationship with my body and my own health. No one wants to date someone that's out of shape and letting their health go to, to, yeah. am I allowed to swear here? Yeah. It makes their health go to shit, right? Because <laughs> like the reality is, is that first of all, if I'm going to be with you, your problems become my problems and my problems become your problems. That's the reality of life, right? Big so facts. I would like to date someone that takes good care of their health and vice versa. It's got minimum problems. <laughs> That's the truth. We're, we're all looking for someone that has got problems that we're okay with, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we've all got flaws. Yes. So it's not about more or less problems. It's the problems that we're content with. Yeah. Like I'm willing to accept this. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I so get you. it's like that whole idea of like allowing your man freedom. It's not allow. It's I'm offering you the opportunity to show me who you are. I'm not allowing you to do anything. That I don't own you. I'm responsible for me. You're responsible for you. I want to see how compatible we are. So I want to see who you really are. This yeah. is why I don't nag, right? One of the things that I'm always telling women is, right, men, and I mean this with love, are relatively simple beings. We, I say this all the time. You are yes. you're relatively simple beings. It's that women don't understand because women, women feel so much all the time. All we do is feel. We feel all day, <laughs> every day, and it dominates what we do. And I empathize because I'm a woman, but- the reality is, is that we are dominated and led by how we feel, right? That's what leads our actions. Sure. So women can go through a whole story in their head about mm -hmm. what you've gone on four dates with a guy and now, and now you're thinking about what it'd be like to get married. Okay, cool. But don't spend too much time there. Yeah. Look at what he's showing you. Because you're building a fantasy around yeah. the thing, elements of him that you you don't yet know. You don't yet know. Yes. And the, the thing is, is that this is why I think a lot of people turn into like the nagging stage. I mean, personally, I don't think there should ever be a nagging stage. You shouldn't be nagging your partner to do anything. You should let your partner know what you need and what you're looking for and vice versa. And then you, you communicate about those things as time goes along with love, yes. with empathy, with compassion, without you did this and you did that and you're never doing this and you're never doing it. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It's surprising to me how long people live in these loops of like trauma led behavior without thinking, maybe I should change that approach because like, that's not working. It's not giving me the outcome that I want. That's mm. the bit that I, that bugs me a bit. Yes. Cause I'm like, come speak to me. I can help you. Yes. And there's lots of people like me, whether it be therapists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, behavioral people, trauma informed coaches, so many people that you can work with nowadays that can get you a little bit further along. Yeah. Some of us more than others, depending upon what you need. Right. Yeah. But there's people out there that have got the hacks for behavior and conversation skills and techniques mm. that will give you more of the outcome that you're looking for. Yeah. I so, want to ask you, sorry, just go going on, because while it's still in my head. <clears throat> so you said about how before, like you're saying about going through your partner's phone. Yeah. And a hundred percent in terms of we build this thought process, this narrative in our head, which makes us feel anxious, right? Might mm -hmm. make a woman feel anxious. And then that's why she wants to see certain things, et cetera. You said you used to be like that, but now you're not. And so, and correct me if I'm wrong, sounds like a lot of it is controlling the thoughts that you have in your head, right? Right thought is mastery. So how did you go from potentially being paranoid about something that mm -hmm. you can't control to being able to accept it? And like you said, give the space right? Where you can let go of the outcome of who he displays himself to be, even though you care about him. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Um, how, how did I get there? Yeah. Because you, you have to change your thought process, right? Oh, you the have to change everything. Way, yeah. So, okay. So I'll give you a little bit of background on, on myself. So my experience in life, um, my dad left my mom when she was six months pregnant with me. And then my stepfather was our next door neighbor. He became us. He became my step my stepfather. And when I was about six years old mm -hmm. and it was a very like toxic environment, he was like abusive and manipulative towards my mother, but predominantly towards me. Now he, 
um, I think has got like high, tra high traits of like BPD, borderline personality disorder, which sort of sits a bit under narcissism. Okay. And, um, that's not me diagnosing him. I'm just identifying that he's got some traits, right? I don't like this whole thing of like when labeling people as narcissists or whatever, yeah. I'm not qualified to diagnose anybody, but I recognize that his, his behavior traits sit very comfortably in a lot of that bracket. Sure. Um, and so I also then had some toxic relationships as I grew up. So I've had some very significantly toxic relationships. I've also been homeless a couple of times. Wow. Um, I've, I've had a lot of trauma in my life mm. significantly. I probably lived 25 years of my life based in fight or flight for, wow. yeah. And I'm 34. So the first six years of my life, no fight or flight. Cause it was just me and my mom. And then the, the other adults in my life were like my grandparents and everybody was like healthy, no abuse no nothing, just like regular people. Yeah. Um, and so, but then from the age of like six through to 16 was like intense abuse every day. Like every day was on it, walking on eggshells, every day fight or flight. And then by the time I was 16, I was homeless for nearly two years and then moved into my twenties where I had like a number of very toxic relationships, um, uh, highly toxic. Right. Um, so I think that I've gone from being someone that was very anxious slash avoidant attached, like definitely insecurely attached in every way yeah. um, to someone that is now like incredibly securely attached. That doesn't mean that I don't have anxious or avoidant tendencies that come out. Absolutely. Sure. If I'm with someone that's more avoidant, it will aggravate some of the anxiousness, but the difference is now is how I respond to it. Yes. So in terms of like, what have I actually done? <sighs> I've done ayahuasca ceremonies. I've done peyote ceremonies. I've done magic mushroom ceremonies. I've done yopo ceremonies, bufo ceremonies. I've been in therapy on and off since I was 14 and I'm 34. Yeah. Um, I've done somatic therapy, talk therapy. I've done wow. a lot of therapies. I've done EMDR therapy. I've microdosed magic mushrooms and created my own microdose. Um, I really apply myself to the work. So what I would say that I do is this. I use every single trigger as mm -hmm. an opportunity to dive deeper into who I am. And this is what I coach and this is what I mentor. I don't like the terminology mentor and coach. This is what I show you how to do. Sure. And the reason I'm good at it is because I know how to do it. You can, you can sit and get your PhD, but if you cannot integrate your shadow, which is what it's called, it's shadow work. Yeah. If you can't integrate your shadow, you're just regurgitating stuff, which is still very helpful because people need that information, that knowledge. But the reality is, is that if you cannot integrate your shadow, you can only do part of the job. And so I think, we live in a society where we're taught run away from your feelings, like go out, get drunk, buy yourself mm. a new car, like do anything to make yourself feel better. Ways like of coping. Sleep somebody else. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's not coping. It's avoidance. It's, it's actual avoidance. You're avoiding mm. yourself. And so like, what did I do? I actually just showed up and did the work. I went to therapy. I looked in the mirror. I, I identified parts of myself that I didn't like. I thought about the sort of person that I wanted to be and how that person would behave. And I realized that doing things like going through your boyfriend's phone isn't a behavior that I want to do. And I don't want to identify with the version of myself that does that. So the version of myself that does that is in pain. The version of myself that loves me is like, if I feel like I need to go down your phone, we've got a real problem, my friend, and it's not going to be my loss. Yeah. And I don't mean that egotistically of like, oh, it's his loss or it's my loss. What I mean is, and I try and bring this, this ideology because, oh, it's your loss is an ego, it's coming from ego. Part of being conscious, part of being awake is understanding that I vibrate at a certain frequency, you vibrate at a certain frequency. Yes. I vibrate the frequency of honesty and truth. So if I feel like I need to go through your phone, you're not a frequency match for me, my love. And that's how I look at it. So that, that for me, there's no loss. That's what I mean, it's not my loss. You're just not a frequency match for me. So I completely agree with you. And I'm kind of playing devil's advocate. Yeah, please. How do you know with the feeling of wanting to go to his phone, how do you know that's because he's not on the same frequency as you? And that's not a past old habit that didn't serve you rearing its head again? Mm, yeah, good, good question. So it's, it's, it wasn't an overnight thing to get to this stage, right? Like yes. I can think about a relationship that I was in with somebody that had a lot of personal problems, addiction problems, amazing human being, but, a lot of problems. Right. And I remember wanting to go through his phone. And I remember the first time I went through his phone finding stuff. So then that, that led on to me wanting to always go through his phone, right? It becomes a toxic cycle. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would always, and I would always find stuff. Mm. Um, actually not always. There were times where I wouldn't, but I still chose to stay. So for whatever reason, the way I look at this now is like, 
that served me so well. I chose to stay at that because for whatever reason I needed, I, I'm so grateful to him because I needed him to behave that way, to trigger me so much to the point where I'd be like, well, you you're the one to, choosing this, Yaz. Yes. You're yeah. 100%. And it's yeah. never him that needs to change. It's me. Mm. It's me that needs to change. This whole idea of like, oh, but if only he would behave like this. No, if the universe is using him to communicate with you, then what's the universe trying to tell you? Very so true. let me go back to your question. So you said to me, how do I know? How do I know what it is? You don't always, even at the stage that I'm at, you know, at the moment I'm going through some stuff with my family. Like I mentioned, there was like a lot of abuse, neglect. Yeah. And there is still moments where I'm like, oh, like karmically, I understand this. Spiritually, I understand that. Like I understand the karmic contract. I understand the quantum physics. I understand the 3D human experience of what I'm going through and what I'm actually just feeling. I still don't necessarily know what the right answer is. Yes. So I sit with it. So I take my time. Now, obviously, if you're living with somebody and you're in a relationship, you might not have all the time in the world. You might have just gone through his phone right there and then and you're like, oh, yeah. yeah? And yeah. you're like, do I smash the jug on the wall or do I scream at him or should I sit on it? Should I wait? Can I wait? You know, is he going to want to have sex tonight? I don't know if I can have sex with him because I'm fuming, you know? <laughs> and it's I love like, that that's an actual question girls have. And yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's actually Well, yeah, point. because you get to the, it's a journey, right? Like I didn't go from... Let me go through the phone and like, oh, and to to where I'm at now, where I'm just like, we're just not a frequency match, honey. Like, it, 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 it didn't, it didn't, it didn't occur. We're just not it vibrating didn't, no. on the same waves, it, babe. I'm sorry literally, to tell you. it was like, a, it's like a, it's like layers and chapters to the experience, right? Yes. So it's like, I go from going through the phone to being like, oh, to being like going through the phone and staying quiet and thinking about it, and then discussing it with my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then from there and, and you move on from there right like you grow yes. from there so like how how do you know if something's a trigger right okay so there are certain things in life what my, one of my favorite sayings is if it triggers you it's yours yeah i love it when people fight back on that one i'm like if if it didn't mean anything to you it wouldn't bother you the fact that it bothers you tells you there's some truth in it you might not like that fact mm. but that's the truth so if it mm. triggers you, it's yours. Mm. Listen, one of the reasons why I always would take my trigger, the reason why I'm at this place, because I'll take the trigger and I'll sit with it and I'll work out why. Mm. Why am I so upset? Mm. And that's what people aren't willing to do. Very it's like, my true. husband cheated on me, so it's all his fault. No, that's not true. That's not true. My wife cheated on me, so it's all her fault. That's not true. That is not true. Mm. And you thinking like that will keep you in a much stickier place than because actually dressing your stuff. It's about recognizing while we don't control how somebody behaves there there is still a level of accountability we have to take in the environment in which that thing happened Abs absolutely yeah. Abs absolutely without a doubt you know like it's, it's, rela relationships are never all one person's fault now even even if someone's beating you up and chucking you down the stairs listen you still play a part in that because you're choosing to stay and i say that as a woman that stayed yeah. you know and that and that's there's no judgment in that there's, it's not, no one's attacking you with that statement. Yeah. What that is, is you can't improve the situation until you are sovereign and you take responsibility for your part. Yes. Every time we blame another, we're giving away our power. So I'm, I'm not saying this with like, oh, it's your fault or like a, like a criticism. It's not nothing at all. None of that at all. I, trust me, I've been there, done that dance, got that t-shirt many, 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 many times. I've flogged that dead horse. I'm I'm there with you, honey. I'm telling you that if you want a different outcome, there is another way. Yes. And that way, the only way, the only way is sovereignty. And I take responsibility for my part. Yeah. I, like, obviously he must think I like being chucked down the stairs because I keep coming back for more. <laughs> You know, like I'm he loves. He must think I love my nose being no, broken. No, obviously, obviously not. No, like no, I say, I say that in jest. It's, it's actually a really serious topic. But what I'm saying is, is that again, if you pull it back to quantum physics and you think about things energetically, if you keep saying yes to something, the universe will keep delivering more of it. It's that it simple. Yeah. So if you don't like it, don't keep going back for more. Mm. Now, and I say that as someone that has been assaulted and gone back for more, you know, so it's, and I, for whatever reason I needed to, I remember having an experience, um, where I'd been physically assaulted and I felt so much shame because I knew I was going to go back to him. And there was only one friend that I had that wouldn't judge me. And I remember saying to her, I know that I'm broken because I know that I should leave and I shouldn't want to go back, but I know I'm going to. And that was like an epiphany for me. Wow. That was a really big awakening. And I'd just done, th I'd just done three ayahuascas. Okay. And it was like, so when you do, when you sit with plant medicine, when you sit with higher powers, 
they will place obstacles on your journey for you to um, grow from. Absolutely. It's, it's, you're, you're being given an opportunity. 100%. Do you want to meet this level of yourself? Or are you not done with that version of yourself just yet? Very, And that's very all it true. is. I have, I'd be very curious to know, have you found the kind of men that you are now drawn to? Has that changed oh, since hugely. you've gone through this? So hugely. tell us, hugely. tell us who you were drawn to before <laughs> and what you're drawn to now. Mm, good question. So I'd say years and years and years ago, like people just stopped sliding in my DMs to like hit me up. Like men only approach me with like meaningful conversation now. I don't ever really get like cat calls. I was saying that on the way here, I got some cat calls. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there you go. But like generally speaking, I get approached with like, there's just, there's a higher frequency in the approach from the beginning. Yes. Um, And... And listen, I, I listen. I don't mind where you're from or what your approach is. I'm like, I feel so confident and secure in my own energy that like we can play. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, it doesn't matter what you say to me. I can I can come back to you. Yeah. Um. Or just ignore you. Yeah. Um, symbols. And so before the men that I that I were were drawn to subconsciously I didn't know this but subconsciously when I look back a lot of them are like my stepfather in some ways there's some like so like for example my stepdad's the middle child of three boys father with some highly narcissistic traits issue with the bond with the mother one of my ex-boyfriends is the middle of three boys oh, father wow. with some narcissistic traits etc you know okay um but they weren't all like that um and I'd like to preface this as well by saying that like all of the relationships that I had that were toxic, they, they all had great times. They were all great guys in a lot of ways, but they, I suppose, lack the education and carry their own trauma. It's like, from my perspective, like it's all love for all of them. I don't, mm. there's, there's no bad blood. I love all of them. I'd go to all of them now if they had like an hour of need or something, yeah. you know? Um, and I'm, That's I'm, amazing. I'm so grateful for the experiences. So grateful because the, I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for them. And yes. I always think, you know, the people that trigger you the most are your greatest gifts, you know? Yeah. Um, and so the men before they were, to be honest, like I've been treated really well overall. There's just been a lot of toxicity in and amongst it. Okay. Um, so what kind of guy are you drawn to now? Oh, you, you've you got to be a provider through and through. Like that's not necessarily a financial <laughs> thing. Yeah. It's more of a like, if the apocalypse happens, can you go and get us a fish out of the sea? Can you hunt? Mm. Like, like, are you a man's man? Like I need a very masculine man. Okay. I've got a very like powerful energy about me. That sounds so arrogant. I don't mean it in an arrogant no, way. No, I, I, know what you, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I can imagine with some guys, especially if you went on a date with them, right? They would feel that they're not contributing a lot of mental and emotional capacity to that space because of how you, you kind of show up in that space. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you and mean. And so they might, they might be intimidated by it or feel like, oh, she doesn't, I'm going to say she doesn't need me. Oh, I so need men. I so, I so need yeah, them. Yeah, that's not the word. It'll come to me. But yeah, I get what you're saying. I can see why. Yeah. Like I, listen, I think that we live in a day and age where it's not that, un, it's not that hard to be unusual. I think a Mm. lot of people fit into a lot of boxes Mm. and I don't mean that badly. I think we've been conditioned to do that. Mm. And so because I live very outside the box, I'll challenge the narrative. I'm not scared to, there's nothing passive about me. Mm. And I find that if a man is not really rooted in his masculinity, he won't be drawn to that because he's more passive than me. And so a woman Mm. cannot be, submissive to a man that's passive or more passive than her so i concur how do you recognize between a difference between maybe a masculine man is just observing a woman who's in her masculine and he's like that's just not for me fair because i hear what you're saying i'm not saying this is what you're saying but i've heard sometimes where a woman might say oh well you know if I'm in my masculine, he has to be more masculine than me. And that's what puts me in my feminine. And it's like, no, babe, you have to be in your feminine first to attract that masculine man. Mm. Right. So how do you tell the difference between that? I don't know if it's so much of a case of telling the difference. Okay. Maybe. So I'm a very feminine, very submissive woman. Okay. However, (laughs) <laughs> it's a very big however <laughs> it, no it is a big however because I'm not passive and because I am somewhat intelligent you know you do have to as a woman you do you have to have a man that's more intelligent than to lead you because otherwise you're not going to trust what he says true right so 
it is true. Like what Jordan Peterson says it, you know, the more intelligent you are as a woman, you know, the, the less men there are to choose from that, that is true, but that doesn't like scare me. I don't think there's any shortage of like good men on the planet or intelligent men on the planet. Mm. Go on. I know you want to say something. <sighs> if you're loving this episode and these kinds of conversations, then I want to give you something. We recently launched the Kits Angels community. This is a sisterhood for women who are tired of what the dating scene has given them and are ready to take their love lives to the next level. It's a space for you as a woman to not be alone in your journey to love where we learn, talk and share our experiences as part of a strong sisterhood with some leadership and guidance from yours truly, of course. Not to mention never before seen videos from me on how I've led dozens of women to meeting great men. And so as a thank you for watching this episode i'm giving you a month's membership completely complimentary on me just click the kits angels link below and when you join the group message me the code phrase angels podcast and i will pay for your membership now back to the episode well i was going to say that not that there's less men to choose from it's just less men that maybe satisfy yeah that desire to be with a man who you can look up to in that sense yeah 100 percent um, and so I, first of all, I think you have to move with the belief there's, there's this, again, this whole narrative between like men and women, right. Mm. About like, oh, women are like this and men are like, this. listen, there's no shortage of good men or women on the planet. There are amazing people everywhere you go. Mm. And our job, your job as an individual is to make sure you are the most amazing version of yourself that you can be, that you feel aligned with. Yes. And as long as you do that work on feeling aligned with yourself and rec like review yourself and be like, you know, I don't like how I showed up in that moment. I feel like I let myself down. I, c I can do better than that. Yes. And when we do that, and whether that's going to the gym or eating better, or I don't like how I handled that argument with my mom, or I don't like how I responded to my friend, or I could behave better at work, or I know I'm getting sloppy with my work. It doesn't matter what it is. Mm. As long as you're committed to being in alignment with where you feel comfortable with yourself, you mm. will always attract people that are in alignment with you. Yes. So how do I recognize this in men? It's very obvious to me. First of all, I can just tell, but then, you know, I also, I also work with the esoteric and I'm very good at reading people and know a lot of psychology. So that helps the skills that. Well, help the ladies out who maybe aren't on that level, but they want yeah. to be able to recognize okay, so a I'll good I'll give man. you some really good, first of all, it's so true. You don't ever need to chase a man. I'm not, I don't believe in the whole chase thing anyway, because to chase something or to encourage somebody to chase you would, in, would insinuate that someone's running, which means avoidance, which means you're looking at insecure <laughs> attachment styles. So we don't need to be chasing no one anywhere. What we're looking for is warm reciprocal energy, right? Yep. If a man likes you, you will know about it. Now, if a man likes you and you don't know about it, that means he's not available. You know, what I always say to mm. women is, like th there's no such thing as confusion with men. Yeah. But if, if a man's hungry, he's going to eat. It's that simple. Yeah. True. You guys are wired to do it. So the way I see it is like this. It's like, if a man wants you, he's going to let you know. The, your job as a woman is to be warm, receptive and appreciative of his advancements towards you. You let him know that, because you don't want him to feel like he's being creepy or putting pressure on you or anything. You need to let him know, you know, like lingering eye contact, et cetera, like mm. physical touch, like uh, an appropriate level, depending upon like how well you know one another, et cetera. These are all things that you can use to communicate with somebody that you're open and warm to their advances, right? With a man, for example, let's say a first date, I always notice how rooted in his masculine energy is from the way that he behaves mm. from like, you know, is he caring about me? Does he want to make my life easier? Does he open doors for me? Does he pull out a chair for me? These are just like basic masculine movements. Like men naturally move towards these things depending upon culture, uh, depending upon culture as well. Right. I, I agree. But I would say that I think in this generation, like, mm. like open the car door, you know, move, taking a chair out to put, you know, sit down and stuff especially for a first date that is very traditional in comparison to today's culture yeah yeah for maybe sure. like within the relationship that definitely might happen but i think i and you can tell me i mean i don't date guys so you tell me right but i don't imagine not a lot of guys in this modern generation would be doing that from the offset that's all i get that's all you get. Oh, that's wow. all I get. That's wow, all I call in. Too. That's all I'm interested in. I think that you get your standard in life. Like if your standard is that you'll live in like a bed sit, you'll, yeah. you'll get your standard. If your standard is that you don't want to work and you'll live only in like a premium accommodation, that's what you'll get. So then I, I hear that. So then do you not think there's any uh, cultural influence based yeah. on the generation? Yeah, absolutely. I do think so. So I know what I'm talking about is quite traditional, but it's also kind of instinctive, right? In the sense that like, 
for example, men are designed to like want to make women happy. That sounds like quite a broad straight statement and quite a strong statement. But what I mean by that is, right, it's like, if you think about sex, for example, yep. it's it's a lot more about the man's per performance, even though that, that sounds bad in a way, but you know what I mean? It's like the, the man probably does more of the physical activity most of the time. Yes. Right? He's and the same, driver. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the man tends to be like the leader in that regard, right? Same like if you're carrying a heavy bag, mm. you know, your man's going to want to carry that for you because you're physically dominant in the relationship, mm -hmm. right? So men are designed to to want to make women happy in some ways. We are also I designed- Really? Yeah. I wouldn't say that they're designed to make women happy because some guys would say you can't ever make women happy. <laughs> but what I would say- It's the wrong women then. Yeah, well, I think- Here's the thing with the feminine. The feminine is constantly moving, right? Yeah. So something, and I, if I speak for the guys, maybe not every single guy, but something I think a lot of men experience is that one day she will want something and the next day she wants something else. And a lot of time guys get very frustrated with that because the masculine typically is known for being very logical, consistent. Mm -hmm. Right? With direction. The feminine does this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes for guys, sometimes I say this to guys, you can't expect her to be you. She's not you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes she'll want this one day and then sometimes she'll want this, right? So I think the endeavor of trying to make a woman happy is not, and you won't like me saying this ladies, is not one that men should aspire to. I think it's more about being a foundation and providing the frame in which she can be the woman that she wants to be, yes. right? Because ultimately we're, we're all responsible for our own happiness. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's what I said earlier, right? So I'm not disagreeing with you at all. Sure. What I'm saying is in those moments, if you sure. see your girl struggling with something, you naturally want to help her. Yes. Like you say, you're problem solvers. Sure. So that's what I'm not saying that you guys are made to make us happy as in like you exist to make us happy. That's not what I mean. Sure. You want to make our lives easier. Very, you want I to agree. solve our problems. That's I what agree. I'm saying, I right? Yes. So it's like if we're having sex, you want us to have a good time. Yes. If if we're at a restaurant and there's nothing we don't that we don't want to eat on the menu, you want us to take us somewhere where we where we can eat something we like, right? True. You want to solve our problems. You want to make us happy. Yes. Just so we want to make you happy, but in maybe different ways, right? I get that. So what I'm saying is that the 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 movement between the two, right, is that if. What was the original question? Because we've gone off on a tangent. That's now. okay, but I don't mind it. You carry on flowing. So okay, so like, so the, the masculine. Like, and then you, you can know, ask something because I've grilled you a lot, and then you know. No, it's fine. Know. I I I like it actually. Okay. I like the challenge. Okay. But the the masculine, you know, it is the masculine is kind of designed to make us happy, just like we're designed to make you happy. Like it's that polarity again, right? Got you. But I also feel that with with the masculine, there's if we're going back to the the initial thing that we spoke about, like with the being led, like how, how am I, how do I find it easy to be submissive with, with a man? There's just, I just have a higher caliber of man, you know, just like a man that isn't more intelligent than me, isn't going to cut it for me, you know? So I, I, and Are you different with that man. Say that again. Are you different with that man? Well, I wouldn't be romantically interested in them. So there'd be a boundary, I suppose. Yeah. But what I mean is, okay, let's say you go on two days with two different guys. Yeah. One guy is very much, the caliber of man in his masculine, et cetera, that you like and that you yes. enjoy. And then one guy isn't, are you different on that day? No, I'll always be myself because- When I say different, I guess, are you more- Would you say you're more quote unquote submissive with that caliber of man that you are looking for than with the other one? Yes, naturally, because the man that, I, that is the caliber, you know, I trust him. I don't need to think about anything. Whereas if I feel that perhaps the other man hasn't got the skill set required to keep me safe, as in your skill set isn't better than mine to keep me safe, yep. then I can't relax. I hear that. How do you know if you don't provide them both the equal amount of space to do that? I do. I will, I will always... I, I'm always observing. So I, first of all, if I'm Keen if I'm on eyes. the date with you in the first place, yes, then you I will already assume that you've got somewhat of that skill set in the first place because otherwise you wouldn't even have me on the date. So what kind of what kind of cues do you see? Because obviously, if you you don't know a guy, right, you have to give him the, the date is for you to get to know him. Yeah, right. So what kind of cues do you see in a guy that makes you go, okay, this is a guy that I would go on a date on? behaviors like what I said to you earlier like if maybe maybe they're out with some friends and they open the door for the friends that are girls or you know things like this like just the way they carry themselves okay. how sure they are of themselves things like that like I would never be personally mm. would never be dating someone that's like getting drunk 
Mm. I feel like when men are drunk, they they become more of a liability in some ways. Like I think that's my, people in general. Yeah, yeah. So no, one hundred. I'm saying <laughs> no, from I'm a woman's perspective of like protection. Yes, um, is kind of how I'm saying it because I agree with you. I think I think that if you're intoxicated and you're sloppy, then of course everybody around you is vulnerable, and you're also vulnerable. Mm. Um, but I'm saying from the from the from the view of being the woman you're with the man for protection and like feeling safe with the man sure. if you're now sort of like all over the place you're attracting unwanted attention you're making me more vulnerable so things like that just like personal conduct how they are out and about yes and the way they speak about themselves and what they do so things like their purpose like how do they speak about the work that they do mm. you know uh, are they lit up by it do they complain about it you know i find because i live between here and bali and you get in Bali, there's like a community of expats where everybody's a bit of a go-getter and they don't necessarily resonate with the nine to five. And then when I come back to London, there's a lot more nine to five lifestyle. Nothing wrong with either. Every, everyone needs to find what works for them. Mm -hmm. But what I notice here is that like the conversation is almost repetitive is that, so I'll notice a lot of people will always talk about where are you next going on holiday? And they'll always talk about like complaining that it's like Sunday night and preparing for like Monday morning work and things like that. <laughs> so, so interesting. it's like when I speak to people that are lit up by what they do, mm. that's a big attraction for me. So for me as a woman, going back to that whole provider thing, mm. when I meet a man that is lit up by what he does, and he's found some sort of purpose for him, whether that's his purpose for his entire life or just for like five, 10 years or whatever. It makes no difference to me. Just knowing that you've got that together. Yeah. That's a really attractive thing for me. So if I'm privy to that kind of information at this stage, that would be yeah. quite important. How much do you think, I remember I was talking to a friend about this a few months ago. How much do you think the work of attraction, the work a man does to be able to attract a woman most of it happens before he's even met her. What's the actual question? Or do, do I think that this is true? Do you think this is true? So the example I'll give is this. So you're saying, for example, you like a man who's confident, who has ambition, probably looks after himself. Yeah, right? absolutely. You, Because you can tell all this before you even say two words to him, right? But that is all work he's already done mm -hmm. to be able to attract you before he's even met you. Yeah, absolutely. So- and, I, and the reason the reason I bring this up is because I think, especially when it comes to dating between men and women, I think women are the gatekeepers to physical intimacy, Absolutely, right? Yeah. Men are the gatekeepers to commitment. commitment yeah. Men do a lot of the work up front, and then it's when they're dating that he's then okay. Is this the kind of woman that I want to choose? Do I mm -hmm. want to commit to, etc.? And that's when the effort becomes reciprocal on her end. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. Okay. But I guess I wanted to know your thoughts on that. What's your thoughts on that? No, I'd agree with you. I think that, listen, I think we both do a lot of the work early on, like like what mm. you said earlier. It's like just taking care of yourself in general, right? Very true. So I think that, for example, let's say you've got a guy that goes to the gym all the time. He's super disciplined and he's got a body like a Greek god, right? Mm -hmm. He's probably not going to be dating a woman that's out of shape and never goes to the gym. No, the men are, um, you know, if I say hypergamy, yeah. High, so like women want a man on her level and above in terms of like economic status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Men are like that when it comes to attractiveness. They yeah, want a girl absolutely. on his level I, or above. In absolutely. Terms, so yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. I, yeah, I totally see that. And I can totally see why. Mm. And bo both those those things make sense to me. Yeah. Um. So no, I agree with you. I think that that makes sense. And I think a lot of it is, is done beforehand. Like if you're someone that takes care of yourself, whether that be go to the gym, work out, eat well, make sure you get a haircut every so often, you know, mm. just basic physical care. That That's just the basics, right? Yeah. <laughs> then when you go to somebody's house, do they live in a mess? Do they Are they organized? Are they clean? Are they tidy? Mm. Do they clear out their fridge? Do they not? Have they got a rotten cucumber that sat there for four weeks? You know, <laughs> these things are all things that, but it's true though, because- Listen, we've, we've all got 24 hours in a day, right? And we're all born with a different set of cards. Some of us are born really good looking with no money. Some of us are born really ugly with loads of money. Like yeah. every, everybody's got a different hand that's dealt to them, right? Yes. And your job is to play the game with the hand that you're dealt. So, so the reality is, is there's so much available to us now. If you're born not that good looking, hell, there are surgeons out there that can take you from a two to a solid eight. <laughs> so the way I see it is that, <laughs> you get to choose how you spend your time. And when you meet someone yeah. with before they speak, you can tell to some degree 
how they spend their time. Like if I meet a big buff dude, mm. I can tell that he spends a significant period of his time in the day. Eating a lot at, of meat, that's eating right. Eating a lot of meat and <laughs> at the gym, right? He's got some, he, so even if he's not disciplined in yes. other areas of his life, I know that he can exert discipline in that area of his life. Yes. That is evident to me just from looking at him, right? Mm. Even if someone's just genetically blessed, they still have to do something to maintain that. Yes. So I know that you are able to exert some form of discipline simply from your physique. And if your physique mm. is the opposite, I also know that you don't spend your time at the gym. I don't know how else you're spending it, but I know that you're not spending it there. So it's like when you meet someone, you can kind of see how they invest their time. Mm -hmm. and also what's important to them. Mm. So same like, you know, when you meet someone that's maybe had like loads of surgery or covered themselves in tattoos, that will tell you that they've got a deep insecurity of not feeling good enough because yes. the only reason you desire to change your body to extremities is because on some level, I'll save a lot of people a lot of money in therapy here, the root cause of every single human problem on the planet Every single problem on the planet, the root cause is I don't feel good enough. That's the root cause of every single cheating, every single lying, every single stealing, every single war. Mm. That is the root cause of every single problem. And so people demonstrate their depth of I don't feel good enough by the way they physically appear. Ways. And also by success, right? If you look at most people that are successful, most of that comes, like, I'm talking like seriously successful multi-millionaires, billionaires, yes. companies that have changed the world. It's usually because they had some sort of experience where they didn't feel good enough. Yes, very true. What do you think is a more powerful driver? I want to succeed or I don't want to fail? I don't want to fail. Yes, yeah, I believe that too. Yeah. And that's not the fairy tale narrative, but I do mm -mm. believe it's true. Well, I think that, I mean, listen, it both comes from the same fear, right? But- the one that we chose is more raw and more honest and more authentic. So it's a higher frequency. So the higher frequency will always win. Interesting. What, why do you think, because I think so many people are struggling in dating. Yeah, me too. Finding that. <laughs> you struggling? No, you no, struggling? no, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm struggling. I'm saying oh, I think a lot, I'm agreeing uh, with your statement. Uh, yeah, I think a lot 100%. of people, I don't find it a struggle. No. I don't. I don't imagine so. I don't imagine so, but I think it's it's one of those things with so many people. I think this illusion of abundance. I think there's an illusion of abundance. Elaborate for me on what you mean by that. I think that, okay, I think for guys, I think, you know, they may dismiss a really good girl because there's five other attractive girls that catches their eye yeah i think maybe for some women they may dismiss a decent guy on a first date because they've got 40 other matches etc but then i think for guys it's like okay out of those women that you think are available to you just because you can be connected to them online that doesn't necessarily mean that they're it's actually the cards, available yeah right or that maybe they'd even take an interest in you i think for many women they think okay i've got 40 matches but out of that 40, maybe only 10 would actually be open to having something significant. Do you know what I mean? For whatever reason, because mm. maybe your energy is not in alignment. Maybe they're not looking for that right now, etc. So I guess my question would be how much do you think there's an illusion of abundance or do you think something else is playing a bigger role into why maybe we, we're not able to fully appreciate what's in front of us? I think that the apps play a huge role in the issue for sure. I think that's scientifically proven. I think that's very clear. You don't you don't have to really be, you don't really have to do that much research or that much reading to dig into that, to, to see that that's clearly an illusion that plays a huge factor in the situation. Yeah. Um, and I think it hurts men and women equally. Mm. Um, what I would say though, is that I think that this, the root of this problem really comes down to a lack of education. You know, typically when you look at psychology, when they discover something psychologically, it takes three generations for it to really take effect in society. Right. And I think things like attachment styles, narcissism, these are all words that have recently been lent into, you know? Yes. And listen, it's not about learning so much about your attachment style that you could write a paper on it. It's more, because again, these are just boxes you can put yourself in, ADHD, depressed, man, mm. woman, like all boxes. Listen, mm. all just human, just working it out. It's all yes, good. Yes, very um, true. But I think that we have this environment where I'm meeting a lot of women that maybe they meet someone when they're young 
and they have a long-term relationship, maybe a marriage, maybe not a marriage, maybe buy a house together. And I just had another po point in my mind that's actually quite an important one as well, but let me come back to it. Okay. Um, it's about feminism in case I forget. Okay, so, I'll remind you. Thank you. So I think that there's this whole thing about, yes, the abundance of choice, you mm. know, because typically if we were cavemen and women, you'd choose someone from your village that'd probably be like your third cousin once removed or something, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad it's not that. Yeah, me too, me too. But now, <laughs> now we're in a stage where it's like, all this technology was supposed to keep us more connected, but we've got more disconnection than ever. And we've got such densely populated cities that create illusions that are not real about all sorts of things, not just dating, yes. but the world we live in, you know, things like po population. <laughs> anyway, so there's like this whole conversation I think is lacking the education. Because if I go back to these women that are like having long-term relationships in their 20s, let's say they end the relationship sometime between 30 and 36, which seems to be a common theme. And if you know a little bit about astrology, there's a period in time in your life called a Saturn return, which happens every 29 and a half years. So between the ages of 27 and 33, it's really common that you'll either meet your soulmate or person you're going to have a long-term relationship with or a long-term relationship can end and you'll experience a lot of very significant changes in your life between 27 and 33. And in astrology, we say the best time to get married is between 28 because you're leaving behind your south node, which is an energy the way you've come from your past life. And between 36, because 36 is when you fully settle into your north node, which is this lifetime who you're going to be in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. me personally, I'm 34 years old. And I'm so pleased I didn't marry any of the people that I dated in my 20s with no disrespect to any of them intended. I think they're all, all amazing. Mm -hmm. But they were not the right people for me to raise a family with. And I think that a lot of people date based upon how they feel rather than psychological education. And it's clear because mm -hmm. if you look at society, it's a mess. We've got more divorces and broken homes and mm -hmm. children being raised in single parent families than there has ever been. Yep. And it is also a really easy way for society to be attacked because it is scientifically proven. And obviously you don't have to be that intelligent to work out that a man has his protective instincts. They spike when he's got someone or something to protect, whether that be a woman, his sister, his partner, his mother, mm -hmm. his child. Mm -hmm. Now, if we all live on a street and there's 10 houses and each of those houses has got four families in them, husband, wife, children. Yep. We're, we're just going to go with the heterosexual one just for the sake of the, the right. explanation, right? Like obviously masculine and feminine roles. Sure. It's going to, those men are going to be inspired to protect their family. And then, so when those men come together, they'll protect that whole street, Very right? True. This is, this is nature, Yes. you know? So if you've got then a bunch of broken homes and five of those houses have got single parents in them, usually a single mother with children. Of course, I don't want to exclude single dads here because you guys are very valuable too. But it's it's a it's a different way of raising the family and therefore you, it's not inspiring the men to be as pr like protective yeah. and rooted in that masculine energy. And that's like nowadays, if we, if we look at like men, like the other day I was walking down the street and I was looking at these two police officers. I was thinking I could outrun you in a heartbeat. And they're like walking down the street eating Krispy yeah. Kreme <laughs> and they look like they eat a lot of Krispy Kremes more than they go to the gym. And I'm just like, what is this? I don't feel what protected by you. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. mad. And, it, and not only that, but when you eat like that it produces more estrogen and less testosterone. That's so why you get grow boobs. Yeah. And, you get and really all of that. Don't even get me started on that. It's a hot, I can't talk about this for hours. <laughs> so, you know, so it becomes a, perpetuati a perpetuating problem. So in terms of like, you know, what is the root of the problem? Yes, the illusion of abundance plays into it, but also just the society that we've got. You know, the fact that it's considered so okay to like get into relationships with somebody, like you get the, these relationships with people, break up, get back together, break up, get back together, break up, get back together. It's toxic. Okay, you either are drawn to each other so much that there's something that keeps, you guys can't resolve that problem. So go to a therapist to resolve that conflict. So you can either resolve it together and decide we can't be together and it's not healthy so you can move on and be with healthier partners for you. Or you can resolve that conflict and have a healthy connection. But what I see a lot of people do is they'll end up like being in a relationship and it's got some problems. They don't really address it. And then they fall pregnant and they either stay together or the baby magnif like magnifies the problems and they separate. Mm. What I'd really like to see people doing is having a little bit more education in terms of how they choose. So I want people to think more about like, what are your deal breakers? What are your must haves and why? So like for me- I think me, a lot of people have that though. No, I don't. 
I don't think people have that in depth. Do you know when I ask people these questions, they'll be like, I want him to be more than six foot. So that, okay, so that's what I mean. Money. Then. Listen, I'll tell you so what's on my list. So they have it just about the wrong things. Yeah, they're not thinking about it properly. What's yes. on my list, right? Given that I grew up in a really abusive environment, my first thing is I want to see how you behave when you're triggered. So I need to know that you can emotionally handle yourself. yourself so that 100%. yeah. So this this is my one of my number one things. This is a massive deal breaker. Can you regulate my, yourself emotionally? Listen, are you taller than six foot? I fine, whatever. Like if you're taller than six foot, great. Like, Luckily for me, I seem to attract really tall guys. Lovely. But that's not really what I'm too focused on. Like, yeah, that's yes. wonderful stuff, but that's not high on my list. What's high on my list is, can you control yourself when you're emotional? Yes. Um, can you communicate your emotions? Can you can you receive from me when I am emotional? Because I feel like a lot of men, they struggle when a woman's emotional. And I understand mm. why. Actually, let me tell you a little story because you're like this, right? Go on, so I used me. to work this woman once. So before I became like, you know, spiritual and everything, um, I used to work in property. I worked in real estate for like seven years. Love it. I'm really good at it and would still do it. And I worked with this woman. She was Eastern, Euro Eastern European lady. She was so sweet. And she was leaving our office. She was a bit older than me and a lot calmer than me at the time, I have to say. Anyway, she, I'm, I'm leaving the workplace though, is she? And we decided to like have a lunch at her place and I meet her partner and he worked for Google and he was a really interesting guy and he was we were talking about relationships and he was telling me how much he trusted her and he was explaining to me how he'd always had these really difficult relationships and how he'd be so attracted to the woman mm -hmm. and then he would get into the relationship with her and then he'd want to control her wants to go through her phone wants to know where she is what she's doing all the time it's not possible to know where your partner is and what they're doing all the time other than just know that they're breathing mm -hmm. you know like it's, you have to live in trust otherwise it's never going to work yes and he told me this story I said well how did you break that how did you get out of that because you obviously trust her like so much and he was like well my mum she told me this story and I said well, well tell me the story mm. and he basically said you know you need to the man you need to be the rock She's the butterfly, like what you said. She, women, we're always up and down, you know. One day we're hungry, then we're horny, then we're like crying, then we see an Oxfam advert and then we're bo pulling our eyes out. Then we can't go to work the next day. Like it's a yeah. lot being a woman, you know, mm. like we we operate on a 28 to 35 day cycle. You the guys are on a 24 changing, hour cycle, yeah? yeah? So true. And so for us, it's it's like to go through the amount of hormones that we go through, there's only actually 12 weeks of the, of the year where we're actually normal, where, where our hormones are normal <laughs> because brilliant. your hormones, the week of your period is... The, the week leading up to it, the week <laughs> after it, you know? So it's just like, there's one week there's of the always. month. There's just one week. And, and that that's the happiest week. That's the horniest week. That's the hungriest week. That's the most productive week. Right. The rest of it, it's just like, ah, just bear just, with us, you just know? Just chuck a dice in, see, see what, what it lands on. Yeah, but this is why we're more emotionally in, in, in tune and developed because we have so much going on in the time that we have to talk you about have it. have to, yeah. Whereas yeah. you guys can, you can keep a bit of a lid on it a little bit more, you know? Yes. So you don't have to talk about it all the time. Plus it's not socially acceptable either, mm. um, which is just a load of nonsense anyway. But mm. um, um, so I think that there's multiple problems. I think the way society is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw a conspiracy theory out there. Not that that's surprising. I want you to tell the story. Um, don't, don't forget the story. Oh, sorry, Dad. I didn't finish the story. Right. It is so, the story. So, he, so you got to be the rock. To. The mum says you got to be the rock as the man. And she's the butterfly. Now, if you're the rock, she's always going to fly away, come back to you, fly away, come back to you because you're a rock, you're stable, you're consistent, you're solid. That's what yep. she needs. That's what she wants. Right. And it's true. We will emotionally stable and emotionally available women will always flock to a man that's consistent and stable. Mm. Like and the minute a man starts to show me inconsistency or unavailability, I'd just lose interest. That's not, I just do. Yes. Before when I was more anxiously attached, I'd be like, <gasps> no, come back. Don't leave me, love me. Give me you the know? validation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, there's something that I say kind of similar to that, that a man is the mountain in which she crashes her emotional waves into. 100%. Please. We just, yeah. we don't need you to cry with us. We just need you to be like, all right, babe, do you want to, do you want to cuddle? Do you want a hot chocolate or try to be quiet? Yeah. And that is something <laughs> That's that what we need. A hundred percent. And one thing that this took me a while to learn is that because we do want to solve your problems, mm -hmm. when you come to us with a problem, immediately we go, okay, well, here's what we need to do. Here's you do this. And sometimes now you just want to be heard. Sometimes we just want to cuddle. Yeah. 
you know, you'd be surprised at how much just a cuddle fixes stuff. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I think one of the things that happens in relationships is naturally like we parent each other a little bit, mm. but which is obviously can be a bit of a killer for like the romance and the spice. Yeah. But the reality is, is that you do take on a lot of roles when you're in a relationship, you know, and we are all wounded children running around in adult bodies. Mm. So I think that, you know, conspiracy theory wise, not that it's conspiracy, it's true. If you look at society, you know, just, you know, things like watching porn, like, oh my God, it's going to kill your relationship. You're literally taking your sexual and your romantic energy and projecting it onto a screen. There was a study done, don't ask me by who, because I couldn't tell you that now. There was a study done where they literally asked men when they'd finished ejaculating after like masturbating to porn to write down their, the first feeling that they felt. And more than 80% of them wrote down the feeling of shame, which shame. is the lowest frequency that yeah. a human can experience. To put that into perspective for some people, there was a man called David Hawkins that um, wrote a book called The Map of Consciousness, where he literally measures the exact frequency of feelings. So I could go and pick some fresh fruit and put it in a bowl and that bowl would be uh, operating at a higher frequency than a human that's feeling feeling shame. Wow. So shame is 20,000 hertz and like a bowl of fresh fruit, like freshly picked would be like 50,000 hertz, which is by the way, the same frequency as anger. So shame wow. is the lowest frequency. So a human that's vibrating at the vibration of shame is has literally got a lower frequency than a bowl of fruit. Wow. And that's what porn does to men. And not only that, but then there's, so for me personally, that looks to me like an attack because Pornhub is one in the top 10 co companies in the whole world, right? In terms of their turnover. Yeah. So that tells me that we have a problem. You yeah. know, we have a problem. Now, the other thing that I think is perpetuating this problem is that men that are feeling insecure, it lowers the frequency of, of the men, right? Yes. But then if we think about how much it requires balls to go up to a woman that you're attracted to and ask her on a date or ask her for a number or whatever it may be. Yeah. Men that maybe feel the fear and don't know how to deal with that or they don't have a lot of self-confidence or they're not six foot two and jacked or mm. they haven't got like a Bentley or whatever. It's it's an easy cop-out, isn't it? You know, to like just, just have a wank basically and get like your needs met. Because essentially before porn, men had to work to get access to women's sexuality. Yeah. Right? Like you would not see a woman naked unless you were having physical sex with her. Yeah. Now I'll bring you back can those see days, whatever you need online, hundred yeah. percent. And it almost You just need two ninety nine and you're good to go. You don't even need that. You just need an internet connection. Yeah, literally you don't even need that. You literally don't <laughs> you even need, need a, that. You just you need, need an need internet that. connection. And it's it's crazy because I think that the reason I say that porn's an attack is because for me, the way I see this is that I don't see any positives about porn. I've had this debate with many people and I'm yet for somebody to tell me the positives of porn. Mm. I, please, I want to be wrong. I would love to, I would love to be wrong, mm. but so far no one's convinced me. And so the way I see it is that if we're taking away the men, because you are, you're lowering the frequency of men. So, so yes, like, you are. I know what you said earlier about like the, the man needs to be masculine for the woman, but the woman needs to be submissive for the man to be in the masculine. Listen, I think it's the chicken and the egg. Sure. Depends on the scenario, right? Yes, the woman should be residing in her feminine, particularly when she's around him to give him the opportunity to lead as the masculine. I agree. But a woman can't be submissive and relax until she feels safe with a man. I, I agree because we all have masculine and feminine in us and the yeah. masculine protects the feminine side of us anyway. Yeah. So she feels that she has to protect herself. It will naturally come you. out, of yeah. course. I, I understand that. So I think that, you know, part of the other issue that we have in society is that we've got a lot of behaviors that mm. make men more feminine. And we've got a lot of things that make women more masculine. I think I, I agree with you, but I, I think a big part of it is the narrative because Absolutely. I think, I think men are told that to be masculine is to be toxic. There are some toxic behaviors. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about healthy masculine. Of course we're talking yeah. about healthy masculine. Um, and we even celebrate, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just different. We celebrate the masculine qualities in women and we uh, <laughs> we shame it in men. Andrew Schultz made this joke, right? He was talking about uh, like, I think it was like a feminist march movement and you know, they're marching with their signs and he they were like, you know, he was saying, oh, uh, you know, you're saying that you wanna be able to, you know, walk around naked and no one says anything, 100% you do that. You wanna be able to sleep with guys and not call them afterwards, 100% you do that. You wanna be able to get pregnant and then, you know, get rid of the baby, not take responsibility, 100% you do that. And he's like, so basically you're fighting to be the fuck boys that you complain about. Yeah, and I, and I don't agree with it. Like I think that 
none of those behaviors make the world a better place regardless of whether men or women do it. I agree. And so I don't think it's about fighting to have, I mean, listen, I think, I think the whole thing with feminism gets really misconstrued, right? Like we, we, we want to be treated equally as in we get equal pay, et cetera. I don't really know that. I think the sexual movement was quite a big one. You know, like mm. if you think about like contraception only came around in what, like the 19, is it 1940s? I'm not entirely sure. 60s. 60s. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So in the 1960s and it's like, that was the first time that women were really able to have a sense of freedom, right? Because you were always expected to be monogamous and faithful to your husband. So your husband knew that he was raising his children. But I think I think the main thing, it removed the consequence of her choosing a bad sexual mate because she now yeah. didn't have to have his child. Exactly. Right? She didn't have to- Same with abortion. Have, yeah, exactly. She didn't have to be vulnerable for, yeah. for, for nine months. Um, listen, we could chat for ages and I definitely get you back when you're back in. Um, but- I'm going to wrap it there for us because okay. you've given us so much golden nuggets for sure. <laughs> um, I don't give them a chance, but thank you so much for sharing your energy with thank us. You. If people want thank to find you, you and even potentially work with you, where can they find you? Um, I'm on Instagram, Yasmin Gold underscore. Um, and there will be like more platforms moving forward, but most, nice. most of my work comes through word of mouth or through my Instagram. Well, some of that work might come from this episode. You never know. It has to be done. It has to be done. Yeah, I can help you shift a lot of different things in your life. Yeah, all right. Let's do it, boy. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you, Yasmin. Guys, go give her a follow. Go check out her stuff. Give her a like. All that beautiful stuff. Thank you for tuning in. And I will see you in the next episode.